Well, good morning, class. At least this is a, kind of a truncated class because we only have the students that, of course, couldn't make it yesterday. I mean, in for a recast of the class on the Third Crusade. And uh, thank you for, for coming. I think we're going to be trying a, a whole bunch of different things here today as we go around. Uh, for one thing, you'll notice all the pictures as you came in. And that's just one way of putting the slides up. We can put them up uh, as pictures on the wall and then travel around to those different places. We're going to go on a little bit of a Socratic journey. Socrates, when he was teaching uh, some of the elite of Greece, uh, they would go for walks. Uh, the only difference being he would ask questions and the students would have to answer. And I'd like to see a lot more of that going on with our class as well but we have a shy group and that's okay. I do want you, of course, to put your hands up when you have a, a question by clicking on your expressive up at in your toolbar and giving a wave as I'm doing right here. So can I see you guys doing that? Good. Can I get away from you, Anjali? And how about Shannon? Wonderful. Good. Okay, well, uh, let's just get going with the presentation. There's a famous book called Tale of Two Cities, uh, the author of that being Charles Dickens. And it's kind of like that when we're looking at the Crusades. We're looking at a tale of two cultures. They have many similarities, but they have some differences as well. We begin the Crusades with the uh, situation in Outrummer, where the Crusader states were, running into some problems with constant conflict. You know, even though that there had been many, let's just say, um, truces that had been worked out, they had a problem. Uh, so I'm going to ask you if you could follow me, and we're going to walk over to where... And of course, I've, I'm putting the web links in Scribbler for... Abigail, who's not in world with us right now, but we'll have her follow along as she clicks on those links. So the first link is to the picture of the Crusader States. And this is about 1100 AD. Now they had gone in in the first crusade and taken Jerusalem and taken a strip of land on the eastern, uh, west, eastern part of the Mediterranean. And uh, that's what they had control of at this point. But there was a... Um, a Muslim leader of the Sunni Muslims by the name of Nur al-Din. And Nur al-Din, he had some different ideas about what the topography of the area should look like when it comes to uh, cultures and, and peoples. He, he felt that it really should be Muslim, and specifically Sunni Muslim, which he was. So that's the picture of Nur al-Din right there. And you can see that he bought a lot of carnage, uh, mostly to other Muslim groups. A lot of fighting going on as he tried to take uh, them over. And interestingly enough, a lot of these other Muslim groups, uh, some of which were Shiite Muslims, actually leagued with the Christians. They actually felt that the Christian community bought a lot of wealth and opportunity. And they also provided... <laughs> A united defense against the expansion of Nur al-Din. Uh, there was another group that he had problems with as well and if you look at the castle the name of that castle is the Eagle's Nest. The Eagle's Nest was the main fortress of the leader of the Hashashans and if you think that that's quite an interesting name because it has hash in it that's no accident. This was a leader of an, another sect of Islam that sort of had given up on both the Sunnis and the Shiites. And he had a group of followers that would do anything he asked. Now, one of the motivating factors in Islam that we often hear about is that when a warrior dies, he goes to he heaven, having died in the name of Islam. He's rewarded. One of the rewards is he has many, many wives that are presented to him up there. And they're, they're all beautiful, attractive, and I, I take it they don't talk back or boss him around. And uh, so this is a fairly uh, substantial reward for a young uh, Muslim, especially if they're growing up in a community where polygamy is the standard. And with polygamy, the only people who could afford to have a number of wives would be not just the young and handsome fellas, but the older and more wealthier and established fellas. So they would uh, collect to themselves their, all their the young wives that they could afford to keep, which would present a problem 
because then the young Muslims uh, would only have access to any kind of uh, opportunity to have a, a mate, a, a wife, a servant, female servant. Uh, and of course, a lot of that came prior to now through the slave trade, where the Vikings were taking hundreds of thousands of prisoners in Northern Europe. And they weren't allowed to ship them through Europe because slavery was actually outlawed and sent hundreds of thousands of slaves down into the Middle East. Uh, not an optimal situation for the women, but for the men, uh, it, it was a, a blessing to them. And with the Vikings converting to Christianity, uh, that wasn't happening anymore. So where were they going to get their women? Well, if they joined with this sect, uh, there were plenty of women that were made available to them and they would give their lives. So for instance, when a sultan came to the leader of this group, uh, he was uh, told that he should be paying tribute to this sultan. The leader turned to the, uh, the follower next to him and just simply said, kill yourself. And the man drew a dagger and stabbed himself through the heart. And then he pointed out to many, uh, one of the many followers up on the roof and said, jump. And the man jumped to his death. Now, it could be argued that the guy was also so high on the drugs that were provided to him that he would do anything he was asked as well. But uh, these fellows became a, a, a very real force. I'm just going to put in a, a video here. We're actually going to go into the boardroom, and if you'd follow me, Okay, so if you want to take a seat, everyone, and uh, we're going to just watch this uh, video. Nur al-Din was the son of the brutal Turkish warlord Zengi. He was ready to continue his father's battle, and he set out to unite the Muslim world and restore Jerusalem to Islam. The Christians saw the rise of this new leader as a serious threat to the Crusader kingdoms. His message was simple and direct unity and jihad. By 1160, the goal of the Muslims, now united under Nir al-Din, was to encircle the Crusader kingdom. He already ruled Syria. Now he wanted to take command of Egypt and its independent capital, Cairo. Egypt wanted to remain independent. It was the stronghold of the Shia branch of Islam and was just as determined to resist Nir al-Din's Sunni Orthodox Muslims as the Christians. Nur al-Din sent in his most talented and ambitious young general to help the Egyptians defend Cairo. His name was Saladin. Saladin shared his master Nur al-Din's ambition to control both Syria and Egypt and drive out the Crusaders, but under his own leadership. And that meant taking on Nur al-Din himself. Five years later, Nur al-Din died under mysterious circumstances. Saladin rushed from Cairo to Nur al-Din's fortress stronghold Aleppo. But a successor had already been announced. The son of Nur al-Din was the new ruler of Syria, al-Sali. He was just 12. But young as he was, al-Sali was no pushover. He called on the services of a group of religious fundamentalist hitmen to eliminate his rival. Their name has gone down in history. The Assassins. The Assassins tracked Saladin down to his tent outside the city walls. <laughs> Saladin was lucky to escape with only a flesh wound. The assassination of Saladin would have been a tremendous blow to the cause and when the assassin actually got into his den, must have created total panic. You can just imagine it. A year passed before Saladin returned, determined to capture Aleppo. Despite the security, the assassin struck again, in a curious and disturbing way. By his pillow, they left a present, some pastries, and with them a death note 
warning Saladin to retreat, or next time, they would succeed in assassinating him. Saladin fled Aleppo again. It was seven years before Saladin's fortunes changed. In 1181, his rival, Al Salih, now 19 years old, died. Like his father and grandfather before him, another victim to die in uncertain circumstances. All right, and much like his father before him, uh, in all likelihood, this was uh, accomplished by the assassins because he had tried to go up against them uh, unsuccessfully and, of course, ended up uh, dead. Uh, now, this has some really special lessons for us because, you know, right now the Canadian government is making some announcements about special security uh, steps that we're taking because of the lone wolf idea, Muslim extremists that act not as a group where they're communicating with each other and these communiques can be ex intercepted, but just lone wolf Muslim radicals that decide that they are going to carry out assassinations and have been doing so here in Canada. Anyway, uh, the word assassin comes from this Hashashan uh, group and Saladin even was afraid of them and ended up leaving them alone, but he went to conquer everybody else and he was incredibly successful uh, with a united Egypt which he got by uh, decimating the forces of the Fatimids and I mean literally tens of thousands of soldiers from uh, northern Africa were uh, destroyed. Uh, they did not want to become Sunni but it didn't matter to him. So after decimating their forces, he, he took conscripted soldiers from Egypt and, the, and Syria and the rest of the places that he had uh, put to the sword and began to go against the Christians. Now, some of the Crusader states were ruled by despots. You know, these were men who had broken faith with the other leaders and even with Christianity itself. And so there was a lot of divisions between them. The threat being so real, the Pope had called out uh, for Europe to take up the cross again, but this had been largely ignored. So another problem for the Christians was that Saladin surrounding them and outnumbering them greatly, there was going to be a need for great sacrifice on the part of the Christians in order to stay alive. It was a, a David against Goliath struggle to the death. But however, uh, even though they were faced with such a, a terrible struggle, uh, there were some really incredible moments in this time of history. Jerusalem, for instance, was ruled by King Baldwin. Let's uh, stand up using F12 and go up back out into the lobby. And you see a very romanticized picture, both of, well, there's Saladin on his horse, and beside him we've got King Baldwin, the, le the leper king. Now, he doesn't look too bad there. But if you go to the next picture, you'll see him wearing a mask. And of course, this would be because um, it, it, leprosy is not a very pretty picture. You know, it was something that he really suffered with. But Saladin was on the march against Jerusalem, and he had 20,000 soldiers with him. Jerusalem by itself could not withstand that. So Baldwin took 500 knights, that's all, that, all he had to work with, and they, they went out and lay in ambush for this approaching army. And as these 20,000 uh, soldiers came marching on Jerusalem, they sprang out and managed to uh, defeat Saladin and his army and drive them away. Now, you know, the history that we hear of Saladin is that Saladin was an, an incredible general and uh, won many, many battles, but he actually lost far more battles than he ever won. Most of his battles that he won were against other Muslims, some of which may not have been all that much opposed to the idea of a one Muslim empire. But when it came to the Christians, he had lots of problems. So he went away and raised another army, this time of 30,000, and was marching towards uh, Jerusalem with an excuse that there was a, a wrong that had to be righted but the resident crusaders knew what he was up to. 120 hospitallers, 
got together on their horses with their full gear and off they rode 120 of them against 30,000 their goal was to stall the march and give Jerusalem just a little bit more time and in fact it was a suicide mission they went against Saladin and not a single one of them survived now what's really important to point out about this is that the standard for warfare up to this point was that when two armies met one of the biggest goal was to win of course but the second goal was to take as many prisoners as possible because they would then subsequently be ransomed and huge amounts of money would be paid for these nobles because there was lots of money back in Europe to pay for their release uh, oftentimes what they would do is they would cut off or the sword hand of the knight so that uh, if he did come back against them he wouldn't be able to wield a sword but nevertheless they at least could escape with their life and there was money to be made to pay for the cost of these campaigns Saladin didn't do that anyway knowing that the writing was on the wall the leaders of the crusader states emptied their garrisons pulled together the largest armies possible so that uh, they could mount one final campaign against Saladin before it was too late. So I'm going to ask if you go into the classroom and that's where I will show uh, the video that details that. Okay so if you want to follow me back to the classroom and if you have a seat then I'll, I'll run that video for you. To defeat the Christians, they would need one leader who could unite the strength of the Muslims under the banner of war, Saladin, and one battle cry, Jihad. Having fought and bullied the Muslim world into a coalition, Saladin would now have to deliver a knockout blow against the Christians of the Holy Land. While the Muslims were unified, the Christians in Jerusalem were led by Baldwin IV, a king who from an early age had been crippled by disease. In the autumn of 1183, from his sickbed, he appointed his brother-in-law, Guy of Lusignan, as regent of the realm. He would be helped by an ally at court, a brutal prince with a deep hatred of Saladin, Reynald of Chantillon. It was Reynald who would trigger the long-awaited war. In January 1187, he launched an unprovoked attack on a richly laden Muslim caravan. Reynald's brutal attack gave Saladin his excuse for war. With 20,000 foot soldiers and over 10,000 cavalry, he marched towards Hattin, near the shores of Lake Galilee. Saladin and his men now stood between the Crusader army and the lake. Guy of Lusignan had no option. In a desperate bid to reach the water, he ordered a charge on Saladin's men. But the weakened Crusader knights were no match for Saladin's highly disciplined army. Saladin's victory over the Crusaders seemed to be complete. I think it's true to say that Hattin is a, a key victory for Saladin, and that he's aware that this is a moment in history in which he's going to be able to make his mark in Islam. Saladin swept through the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem. Acre, Caesarea and Jaffa all quickly fell. Inside Jerusalem, the Christians knew they stood no chance in a siege against Saladin and his mighty army. If Saladin attacked the city, they threatened to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of Islam's most sacred sites. Saladin thought about this. He decided to take a prudent line of action. He would spare the Christians if they paid a ransom. This was agreed, and Saladin entered the holy city, his goal, his target, in peace. The reason he is hero-worshipped in the Arab world is that he was the one who took back Jerusalem, made it an open city, once again for believers of the book. Jerusalem was in Muslim hands again and it had been taken peacefully, unlike the Crusader occupation 88 years earlier. 
again, 20,000 uh, of the resident crusaders against a, an army of 30,000. They were cut off from water. They had to spend the night in this valley where Saladin and his men were raining fire missiles down upon them. So very little sleep, and throughout the night and the day, uh, the bushes in the surrounding area were lit, where the wind was right to blow the smoke into the nostrils of the crusaders. So you can imagine how thirsty they were getting the next day in the, in the heat, and especially wearing uh, all of their accoutrements for battle, expecting at any time. And so finally, when they did go up against Saladin, they were no match. Prisoners were taken and released, uh, a total of two. Those who were captured were executed, with the exception of the leader of the Knights Templar and the king of one of the Crusade states. Now, my question would be, after the Knights Templar leader saw all of his men either killed in battle or executed in front of his eyes, and the king who had led this defense and had lost all of his men, and not only had he lost all of his men, but he had lost Jerusalem as well, because there was no defense for Jerusalem anymore. So leaving these two fellows alive, uh, my guess is, uh, was not so much an act of charity, but the worst kind of punishment that Sadin could dish out. He was able to march to Jerusalem. And this is what you'll always hear about Saladin, and I don't care whether it's in high school or whether it's in university. You will hear about what a great saint Saladin was, an example to Christians everywhere of how civilized the Muslims were. He went into Jerusalem, and he didn't kill the people there. And for this, he's afforded um, saintly status. But again, as it points out into the movie, they don't go into great detail, but there was no battle. Uh, there were no defenders to kill who were fighting back. It was a, a surrender that was brokered by a deal. And the deal was that the Christians wouldn't destroy the mosque inside if Saladin would agree to enter peacefully. And so he held to that bargain, but he took them all prisoner. And that's not talked about. Having taken them prisoner, he did ransom them. And so there was a huge ransom paid for each individual had to have someone pay a price for them to be released. And for those who weren't released, they became slaves. And of those, we have no idea how many were eventually put to death or even worse, were allowed to continue to serve on. Now, the brutality, I, I cannot even, as a teacher, and given that you folks are only in grade eight, I can't even tell you about the things that Saladin and his army did to those, those prisoners of war. They just go beyond my imagination, and, and it, it would be very unsettling for me to share that with you. But at the same time, he is um, seen as a great example of... Um, courtesy and uh, thoughtfulness and uh, kindness that Christians should have taken an example from. So into this situation you have the Pope calling for crusade and finally now that Acre was gone, Jaffa was gone, Jerusalem was gone, the knights and kings of Europe were ready to proceed. And so there were uh, more than three but the main three kings that answered the call were Barbarossa, and we can quickly, why don't we just go take a look at those guys. And you may need to zoom out in order to get out of your chair and to come and take a look. Let's just first of all go to the map. And you can see what the situation here was now. You've got Saladin's empire, which is an, only had a, a couple places that weren't taken uh, at this point. And the three kings that answered... I have them over here on the wall. First, we can look at King Philip. King Philip was actually a friend of King Richard in England. Even though their countries were often at war, King Philip was 10 years younger than King Richard. And uh, as princes, you know, King Richard wasn't seen as uh, taking the throne because he was the third uh, son of his father, King Henry. It was actually King Henry of England who had elected or appointed his drinking buddy as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, 
with the idea that his friend would be good to him and allow him privileges and uh, power afforded to him by the church that uh, another archbishop likely wouldn't do. But when Thomas Becket became the new archbishop, he actually took it quite seriously and ended up standing up to Henry II, not giving in to Henry II's demands, which caused Henry II at some point to say, I wish he was dead. Four knights, having overheard that, felt that it was their duty to uh, see that the king's wishes were obeyed. And so they went, and much to King Henry's horror, uh, killed his friend, which we don't really think was intent what he intended, but it's what the outcome of it. So Henry II repented, and trying to make up for his uh, <laughs> perceived sin, uh, agreed to go on this crusade. Now his two oldest sons died, leaving Richard who had been sort of the um, prodigal son, if you will. He was not exactly princely in his behavior. He was quite a rogue. He was a, a womanizer to the extreme. He was a warrior to the extreme. It seems he was everything to the extreme. But he uh, got the mantle of uh, taking on uh, leading the English army in the crusade and was just delighted by that. Another fellow who was delighted by that was the Barbarossa. He was the king of Germany, but as you can see by this map over here, beside him, the uh, light green area, and I'll use my pointer to show this, uh, this green area here was Germany proper, but they had also taken over the Slavic principalities to the east. They had also gone down south and taken over Burgundy, parts of Italy, um, the papal states, papal states, uh, were kind of safe because that belonged to the Pope, but he was wanting to press down into southern Italy, which was uh, loyal to the Pope, and the Pope opposed him, uh, as he did when um, he was uh, Barbarossa was trying to extend his territory over here, uh, to the east of the boot of uh, of Italy. Uh, after suffering some reversals, Barbarossa came to the conclusion that it wasn't man that he was fighting against, but he was fighting against God, and that God was calling for him to repent and to serve him rather than to serve himself. And so the Pope accepted, accepted him back lovingly and suggested to him that going on the Crusades might be a good idea. And then there's King Richard on his Arabian charger, the ultimate knight, and the stories of him in battle are, are quite interesting to hear, which I'm going to have you come and sit down again so that you can hear those stories. In May 1189, the first army of 100,000 men left Germany, led by Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. But Barbarossa drowned in a freak accident crossing a river on the way to Jerusalem. This left the newly crowned King of England at the head of the largest crusader army, the 33-year-old Richard I. He'd spent most of his life fighting in Europe and knew that success in battle required a full war chest. In June 1191, after months of meticulous preparation, Richard's troops broke through the walls of Acre, capturing the city and taking 2,700 of Saladin's men hostage. Acre was a great victory for the Crusaders and for Richard. His courage in battle gained him fame throughout the Christian world, and with it, a new name, Richard the Lionheart. The Third Crusade could now advance to Jerusalem to recapture the Holy City. The triumphant Crusader force of 12,000 men left Acre in August 1191 and marched south toward their final goal, Jerusalem. But then he made a monumental and startling decision that shocked his army to the core. Richard stopped a few miles short of the Holy City. He'd come to realize that if the Crusaders captured it, they would not be able to hold on to it. Richard feared his depleted force of 12,000 men couldn't hope to take the Holy City and defend it against Saladin's vast army drawn from across the Muslim world. He had failed in the primary mission of the Third Crusade, to recapture Jerusalem. Saladin launched a lightning attack on the coastal town of Jaffa, next to modern-day Tel Aviv. Richard reacted immediately. 
he gathered a tiny force of only 55 knights and crossbowmen and sailed down the coast to Jaffa. On the beach just in front of the town, Saladin's admiration for the Crusader King grew as he watched Richard drive the Muslim forces off the beach and into the town. Saladin decided the best option was to make a truce with Richard the Lionheart. It was agreed the Christians would keep the coastline towns from Jaffa to Tyre, but Jerusalem would remain in Muslim hands. As a concession, Christian pilgrims would be allowed to enter Jerusalem to worship at the Holy Sepulchre. Richard the Lionheart himself never set foot in the Holy City. He refused to enter Jerusalem as long as it was in the hands of his enemy. Richard the Lionheart never returned to the Holy Land. He died in 1199 from an arrow wound he received while fighting in Europe. Crusades would be periodically launched over the next 100 years, but the enthusiasm for reclaiming the Holy Land eventually began to wane. Okay, so um, that's uh, the story in a nutshell, but it doesn't really uh, give us a really good picture at all of what was really taking place. So I'm just going to briefly go, th go through that. Um, let's start with Barbarossa. He uh, had gone on the Second Crusade, but had never actually arrived even at Constantinople because he'd, his army, as it marched across Europe, was uh, causing more damage to Christian communities than uh, they ever hoped to inflict on Muslim communities. They were just a ragtag bunch of brigands. And so he turned them around and marched them back to Germany and said, no, I'm not taking you any further. This crusade is over for us. So knowing that there was going to be another crusade, he set about creating a new army. And this new army was disciplined and very talented and skilled and it was an army of 150,000. Now, typically in the past, where a country might have spent, sent 50,000, only 10,000 or 15,000 of them might have been soldiers. The others would be their wives or thieves and pickpockets and whoever else looking for uh, perhaps to ride the coattails of the crusaders to riches in the Holy Land. But in this case, the 150,000, they were soldiers well-trained and well-disciplined and he had a very strict set of rules uh, so nothing like what we're we've been hearing about with Saladin uh, the rules were such that for instance if you were to cause any problems for anybody on the on the trip uh, you would be severely dealt with uh, even if the lords were unfair to their soldiers they could face execution and anyone who mistreated a Jew which we remember in past crusades had been a problem uh, would lose their hand and be sent home. So very, very strict punishments put in place to prevent things from happening. Now, he marched with his army as far as Constantinople who, to meet up with Richard and King Philip in the Holy Land. And when he got to Constantinople, of course, the ruler there, who, if you remember in the Second Crusade, uh, they had had truces with the Seljuk Turks, and the basics of those truces were that crusaders would not be allowed to pass through Anatolia, which was just exactly what uh, Barbarossa was wanting to do. So finally, they avoided uh, all-out war by agreeing to have Barbarossa and his troops ferried over towards the Holy Land, the northern part of the Holy Land, and bypassing Anatolia. When they got there, of course, there was a, a quite an unwelcome <laughs> mean committee uh, set up by the Seljuk Turks who harassed them as they made their way southward towards Jerusalem. Many soldiers were killed by um, surprise attacks as they snaked their way down. Uh, and then, unfortunately, as Barbarossa was crossing a river, now at this time, remember, he was 70 years old, uh, something happened, whether it was a heart attack or he slipped or the current got him, but he drowned. And at that point, the great majority of the uh, troops had either had enough or were distraught over their leader's death. And the vast majority of them turned around and headed home with perhaps only about 20,000 or so continuing on down to the south. So from 150,000, they went down to something like 15 or 20,000. Uh, now, King Richard and King Philip came by ship 
uh, towards Acre. On the way, King Richard, who was uh, always looking for action, decided to take over Sicily. And then when he got to Cyprus, which was a Byzantium holding, understanding that Constantinople wasn't exactly a friend of the Crusades, he took Cyprus. And while he was there, uh, fell in love and married someone. All this in a short, brief period of time. But then he arrived with King Philip at Acre, where the remaining crusaders that had been left uh, alone in um, the Holy Land had been besieging Acre as probably the single hope that they might have of gaining back Jerusalem, because it was a port city. So they had dug in really well, so well that Saladin didn't even risk attacking them there. And, uh, they had been uh, put Acre under siege for something like two years, where the residents of Acre bravely held out against these uh, knights. And the knights, of course, were they'd eaten all their horses. Uh, they were reduced to eating grass. They were starving. So it was a terrible, terrible situation for them as well. And then, of course, King Richard and King Philip came uh, with supplies. And so they were reinforced and um, were finally eating again, and uh, they attacked Acre. And they were able to take Acre very quickly with the forces that were available to them, which led to another problem, because having taken Acre, they now had 2,700 Muslims that had surrendered to them and uh, were being held prisoner. King Richard approached Sal Saladin. He said, you know, let's, let's make a deal. You know, for one thing, we don't really want to fight you. We just want Jerusalem back. So yield Jerusalem to us. And Saladin said, no, you're going to have to take it from us. So he said, okay, fine. Well, I have here 2,700 defenders uh, to be ransomed. Saladin's representatives, you know, would have asked, well, uh, what do you want for them? And he said, uh, just one thing, a piece of wood that the 20,000 uh, crusaders had carried into the Battle of Hatton, then that piece of wood was supposed to be the actual cross that Christ was crucified on. And when Saladin conquered them, he took that piece of wood and sent it off to Damascus. It didn't mean anything to him. He, he would have just as soon used it as firewood, but thought it might be useful at some point in the future. And here it was. Here was his opportunity. He could trade that useless piece of wood for 2,700 Muslim prisoners who had defended Acre so bravely, and their families. But Saladin decided that those 2,700 prisoners were of more use to him in the hands of King Richard than free. They had to be fed. They had to be guarded. They also couldn't very well leave them behind as they went down to Jerusalem. They'd have to leave too many soldiers behind uh, to, to guard them as well. And so King Richard grew very impatient and <laughs> demanding, come on, you, you better take these prisoners. And Saladin was having nothing of it. So King Richard eventually, having no other choice, uh, took them out and executed them in full sight of Saladin and his troops. And I think really this was kind of the beginning of the end uh, for uh, Saladin, because his own troops totally lost respect for him. And towards the end of this story, he would give orders, and they would not be obeyed. Now, you won't hear that, again, in courses that talk about Saladin being the greatest general that ever lived. And so those 2,700 prisoners were, were executed, uh, along with their families. And again, a, a terrible tragedy, and war is a brutal thing. Uh, and I'm not excusing it, but saying that there was a way out that Saladin could have easily taken to prevent it, and he chose not to. So now King Richard and his troops were free to go to Jerusalem. And I say King Richard because when Acre was taken, uh, the English put up their flag, the French put up their flag to celebrate the victory, and the Germans came along from Barbarossa's camp and had aided in the taking of Acre and put up their flag. For some reason, the English crusaders took it down. So the Germans were very upset by that. And they said, fine, uh, we're leaving then. And off they went. And then Philip got sick. And not only was he physically sick, but I think that he was uh, clearly seeing that King Richard was taking charge of the whole crusade and hogging all the glory for himself. And so he said, fine, if you're not going to share the glory of this campaign with me, I'm taking my troops and we're leaving too. 
So we went from an army that numbered somewhere around 250,000 warriors down to what was left. And it was basically about 15,000 English soldiers that marched down towards Jerusalem. Now, on the way, they took the port of Jaffa. On the way down, they also took the encampment of Escalon, which was a place from which they could launch their attack on Jerusalem. However, while they were there, King Richard had counsel with the resident knights who said to him, you know, um, after all the battles that you've just been through, you've got about 12,000 knights left. And uh, just take a look at Jerusalem. You'll see that it's uh, miles and miles of walls that have to be defended. You can't do it with 12,000 knights. You might be able to take the city, but you'd never hold it. So uh, this was becoming a suicide mission. Uh, for King Richard and uh, he was thinking about what to do when they heard that Jaffa had been taken uh, again by um, Saladin and so you heard the story with King Richard himself with 55 men went back and retook the city it's just an, an amazing feat which tells you something about King Richard as a warrior greatly greatly admired for his um, his skills as a general and warrior back he went he led his men back up to Acre. Uh, they were distraught, uh, but they were reinforced uh, somewhat. They had new supplies, and uh, the winter passed, and with the uh, better weather, uh, they, he decided to march down to Jerusalem and got within sight of it before turning around and heading back. But before he headed back, uh, and Saladin at this point, uh, they had defeated Saladin's army, who had attacked them these 12,000 crusaders, uh, drawn up in a tight formation. And after Saladin, with his uh, huge numbers of uh, soldiers, had thrown themselves against this formation over and over and over again, trying to break it, uh, they were exhausted. And at that point, uh, King Richard gave the signal, and uh, off they went, uh, the knights charging down after Saladin's troops and, um, and defeating them. So at this point now, Saladin's soldiers had no faith in him. They wouldn't obey him. Uh, and Saladin uh, knew that uh, any defense of Jerusalem was hopeless, was shocked to see that King Richard wasn't attacking. And so when King Richard approached him now and said, I have a deal for you. Uh, we will leave Jerusalem in your hands, which was the only hope Saladin had of staying on, if you allow Christian pilgrims to travel through Palestine. And the deal is, Arab uh, and Muslim pilgrims will be able to travel through the, the Crusader states if uh, you know our, our pilgrims can travel through your states, you know, through Muslim territory safely. And so the deal was struck. And so in a sense, although King Richard didn't win Jerusalem back, uh, he knew he would have lost it anyway. It would have been a pariah victory, if you will, where the losses would have been greater than your than your victory. Um, it was the right move to make. Uh, people often talk about it's uh, still a mystery why he did that. The other thing that was going on at the time is that uh, King Richard was also hearing that his younger brother, who he left in charge of England, was actually seeking his throne. And of course, this comes into the story of um, Robin Hood and Maid Marian and all the rest of that, and the Magna Carta, which we're going to look at next class. He also heard that uh, King Philip was uh, having new designs on England himself and on uh, English territory and on the mainland. And so he figured he'd better get back pretty quick. And he did. On the way, he was arrested by the Germans, who um, didn't care for him too much and felt that he was responsible for the assassination of one of their leaders, uh, King Conrad, you know, of the Crusader States. And so uh, he was arrested and held ransom. And by the way, his mother was uh, Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, who had married King Henry and who fathered five sons through her. Anyway, uh, he... Uh, joined the battle over on the uh, continent and uh, was wounded by an arrow but not before he was able to designate his younger brother John as the king, new king of England and so a new a journey begins there but you know I think there's 
rich ground here for some comparisons between what was happening during the Crusade and what's going on now. While a lot of people would say the Crusades were successful and that at least for several hundred years uh, there was a Christian presence again in a land that had been Christian before the Muslims took it over, and that Muslims can be defeated, but in the end you saw that the sword didn't win back the Holy Land. I was just listening to the son of a Muslim leader who came from a pretty radical family, but he was reading the Bible, and in it he read the words of Christ, who said, Love your enemy, and his heart was broken. He knew that the God that he worshipped uh, didn't love his enemies, and that this God was one who was a God of peace and of love, and he was conquered by those words, uh, and hopefully by the living out of them as well. So while I'm not going to pass judgment on the Crusaders and what they felt that they needed to do, uh, it was a different time and a different place, but we do see an example of war being one response to uh, aggression from Islam, and uh, some might say it was successful in the short term. But in the long term, it wasn't. And after uh, the Crusades were over, many Christians received a, a great deal of punishment. And history recounts the Crusaders as the bad guys, as the aggressors. Even though, uh, you know, in this class, we've been able to look at another side of it. I'm not sure that we want to go there again. The decision for others to make, but for us to participate in, something for you to give some thought to that ends the lesson really for today. Thank you for coming today. I've recorded this. I'll be putting it on tape so it'll be in the study booth for you to come and see during the week. Thank you very much for attending. With that, I'm going to end the recording and take your questions.